a great global awakening. I love it. Great global awakening, a movement of the spirit unlike anything the world has known is coming. That just gives me Holy Ghost goosebumps. Yeah. I think that's happening. I think we're, we're in that, the beginnings of that shift. And even Howard, I just have to tell you, when I first came across your story, it was January of 2014, and God used your testimony to bring about a monumental shift in my life, like an awakening came to me just because of your testimony and just the words of Jesus and some of the other stuff you had to share about what Jesus revealed to you. And by the way, for our listeners... Welcome to Sozo Talk Radio. Sozo Talk Radio. So thank you for joining Sozo Talk Radio. I'm here with Howard Storm, and uh, we'll be discussing uh, some details of, well, uh, details of, of his, his book, which I've got here. We've, we're going to tackle the, the topics of his book, Befriend God, Life with Jesus, which I've been reading. And uh, we also have a few questions um, just about your, your near-death experience, too. I had some feedback from some, from some friends. Okay, it looks like you're sorting things out over there, huh? He's getting the light on. Light. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So out of all the things you could have been doing, Howard, like, uh, you know, um, rock climbing or skydiving, you chose to do <laughs> this interview. So thank you. <laughs> so this is going to be an important, um, important interview, I'm sure. And by the way, uh, to our listeners, if you, uh, if, if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and leave a comment in the comment section. We're going to be reading some comments from a, a previous interview that Howard and I did. And just sharing some of those, because I'm sure you'd love to hear those, Howard. Uh, sure. Just how you've touched some hearts and lives. One heart and life you've touched in particular is a friend of mine, Chris Bellato. And I've actually had him on my show, Sozo Talk Radio, um, just to, to chat about some God encounters and things like that in his testimony. It was pretty brilliant. But he loves your testimony. And it really, right. really, really blessed him, um, especially to hear our, our interview together. And he had, he had this to say. I'll just cue it up here. He said, first of all, Howard, thank you. Okay, wait a minute. He says, thank you for opening my eyes to how good Jesus is. And it brought him a lot of comfort, you know, when he, because he was stressing out about a lot of his childhood friends that didn't yet know Jesus. Yeah. And uh, just to know that God is on the job and that he can yeah. <laughs> like trust, that. God trust is their on souls. The That's good. Yes. That'd trust be a good book title. God is on the job. Yes. You know? And I love that. I love, I love talking about that and uh, unpacking that too, because it reminded me what he said there. Okay. So yeah, that, that he just wanted to thank you for that. And then it made me think of those scriptures, you know, how in Joel two, where it says, God has poured his spirit on all mankind, you know, it, like there's no one left out that God, God's spirit isn't actively doing something with he's, he's working with us. Yeah. So he's on the job. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and another scripture too. I, I love just sharing these scriptures because this is just um, brings a lot of comfort to my soul. Like where where he says, Jesus says, "No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, and at the last day I'll raise them up." So, and then he says, "When I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself." Mm -hmm. It's pretty brilliant. So his name is famous, of course, through the world. Um, there's hardly a soul who hasn't heard about Jesus. Um, he's unfortunately just often misunderstood that's kind of um yeah that's a, a a whole topic we could talk about sometime about how um if people knew the truth and there and there is a truth and it's an undeniable truth mm -hmm. about jesus um i think they would take it a lot more seriously but there's so much misunderstanding misdirection lies deceit deception um and and madness just pure madness craziness mm -hmm. about what people say about jesus that are patently untrue mm -hmm. and for two thousand years there has been a pretty solid body of people trying to speak the truth about him mm -hmm. And the um, opposition, in some senses, seems to be standing pretty strong in their opposition to speaking the truth. 
it's it's an interesting battle yeah yeah it is a battle and 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 standing up for the truth i'm not feeling it personally like you know i'm seeing some of my friends being led astray perhaps by some false teaching and whatever else i'm like do they just need to go through their process will they come out of this in five or ten years and for the you know be better off for for you know in the in the long run because oftentimes our trials you know we end up better off because it crushes our ego and renders us ready for grace and, yeah. and a true so, um, one of my favorite authors is thomas merton who is a monk in kentucky where i live yeah and he was also a poet and a photographer and a photograph he took was of a huge hook hanging from a cable over a field and you couldn't see the crane or what the the cable was attached to it's just this hook hanging in the sky and he titled it the only known portrait of god and i absolutely wow. um <laughs> I think of yes i think of god out there trying to um catch us you know um but of course the hook is love and truth mm. and goodness um and people um some people go for it and some people avoid it. And um, I had a, a teenager from my church yesterday mm -hmm. say to me, and I quote, how can I make people believe in God? <laughs> I said, wow, great question. I said, I wish I knew the answer to that, but I don't think you can make anybody believe in God. Only, only um, they in cooperation with God can do it. I said, you can speak the truth to them. You can encourage them. You can um, tell them when you disagree with them. You can love them. You can pray for them. You can do all those things. But make anybody have faith? No, it's not yeah. possible. Yeah. Faith comes from, from God to a receptive heart and mind. Yeah, yeah, and I like so that. I, I just want to say that I, I appreciated the compliment but I don't, I'm just, uh, I'm just telling the truth, you know, I'm, t I'm just telling what, what I, what I've experienced and what I've learned and what I know. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't deserve any credit for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I only hope that um, my uh, example would encourage more Christians to be a little more outspoken. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I grew up in um, Massachusetts, and there were three things you never talked about: mm -hmm. sex, politics, and religion. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't talk about them. They were they were uh, you no, know, not openly, um, and. You know that we're going into a uh, post-Christian world, like Europe has gone into, because too many. And and I and I, I just want to say I don't mean by beating people up or being obnoxious. I mean by um, just talking about uh, the love of God and the and the, the faith of a good God that we believe in. Yeah. Which le which leads me to which is why I wrote the book, right? Befriend God, Life with Jesus. Can I? tell you why I did that? Absolutely. That was going to be my, one of my next questions is what inspired you to re write your book? Well, I've been, I've been trying to write this book for actually several decades. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean that quite seriously. I would, I would make these um, starts and stops and starts and stops. And what, what kept me from doing it was of course, I was reading books about Jesus and I was saying, oh, man, this is so good. Like, I don't have any, I, you know, this, this author said it so well. <laughs> like, you know, who am I? I can't, I can't write like that. I'm not that knowledgeable. Da, da, da. So that, 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 would, that would put it aside. Then the other thing was is that um, who, who am I to um, talk about Jesus? No, I'm, I'm not. And I, I'm not saying this in, in false humility. I'm saying, I mean, I really like, who am I to talk about King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Savior, 
son of God, you know, you know, I mean, well, you've met him. So there's a start. I'm not, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. You know? Right. Yeah. It's and, such a joy. Uh, yeah. And so anyways, I came to, I, I've been in um, Christian ministry for over 30 years and I came to realize that um, so many Christians, not all, but so many, don't have a real intellectual understanding of Jesus and don't have a real appreciation for who he is. And I thought, this is, this needs to be um, addressed. Mm -hmm. So what I wrote the book for believers or would be believers. It's not, it's not Christian apologetics by any means. It's, it's um, a friend of mine, another pastor read it and he liked it very much. And he said, this is confirmation for adults. And mm -hmm. I said, that's exactly what I was after. <laughs> trying to right. get adults to, um, you know, have a, uh, a real, you know, in theology we call it Christology. I didn't, I didn't want to use that word because that might put people off, but it's the study of Christ, who Christ is. And that's what my yes. book is. It's an attempt to, um, for, um, it's, it's not a scholarly book. You know, it's, I didn't write it for the academic world. Um, a, uh, um, scholar would say, well, this is not, you know, esoteric enough, not scholarly enough for us, but for, yeah. for, for many people, uh, um, I think that it would, uh, provide clarity. And I, I would also, um, I, I, believe that the book is very, very um, mainline, traditional, 2,000 years of theological um, yeah. understanding. I think it, it falls within that category. And I think that um, I would like to think that it would transcend any denomination. I did, um, mm -hmm. whenever I, I felt like I was getting into things that might be specific to a certain denominational point of view, Mm -hmm. I, I just backed away and didn't didn't go down that road. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I believe that. Um, the bottom line, I just want to say that I believe that this one church, and this one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one God, and that's who I was trying to s speak to for and with. And I think it's wonderful that there's thousands of different worship styles, thousands of different types of community. Um, I think that glorifies God to have that diversity within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. But there's one, Jesus says that they all may be one. Yeah. And he speaks about the unity of the body. And Paul speaks about the unity of the body. And, and it's not like, hey, kids, let's, get, let's all get along. Let's be nice. No. No, it says that, that we have to be unified. And I um, am distressed and disturbed when people do not seek harmony mm -hmm. because we can have diversity without harmony. You know, it's like, um, you know, if you, if you don't like Indian food, you don't, we don't have to go to the Indian restaurant. We can, you know, go to the Mexican place, where, which we both mm -hmm. like. You know, I mean... <laughs> I'll go to the Indian restaurant with someone who likes Indian food. You know what I mean? You know, the, our, our worship styles may differ. And my, one of the great pleasures of my wife and I is that we love to go to different kinds of churches. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when I go to a Pentecostal church, I am Pentecostal. And when I go to a <laughs> Catholic mass, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, we just adapt and we, and we love them all. Yeah. The, on, the only, the only worship we don't like is when it's, um, uh, when there's no um, spirituality there, it's just sort of, you know, dead kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Well, my wife and I are the same way. We are, we are like itinerant worship leaders. So we'll travel yeah. around and we'll lead worship in all kinds of churches. And just like you say, I can, I can vibe with wherever I'm at because it's, it's Jesus that unites us. And really that's the key. It's like, are they in relationship with Jesus? If you, if anybody Amen. on the planet is in relationship with Jesus, we are one in Amen. him. And, yeah. You know, uh, the way I describe it is like, there's kind of, it's very simplistic, but it's been my experience. There's two kind of people, people that love God, 
which of course super includes Jesus in that description. And then it's people that love religion. Hmm. And I fall in love with the people that love God, no matter who they are, no matter what language, no matter what their worship style. Hmm. And I want to kind of avoid people who just love religion because mm -hmm. I'm not so into, I'm a, only, only from an anthropological, sociological um, worship, you know, hmm. you know, I, I, I um, you know, when, when, when religion becomes the religion, the dogma of the religion becomes the worship, or you might call it Bible idolatry, mm -hmm church idolatry or dogma idolatry they're, to me they're all idolatries and they're all missing the point mm -hmm. yeah i've been i've experienced all of that like um yeah. you know i was the bible all tree kind of guy you yeah. know ele elevating you know even to the point where i'm like memorizing portions of scripture and finally i come across a scripture in john you know where god highlighted it of course i'd read it probably several times but god highlighted it one day and it says you search the scriptures diligently, thinking that by them you have life. Yet they are that which testify of me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And I feel wow. it's, wow. it's wow. wonderful to have. Wow. I got I to gotta yeah. get that one down, yeah. Yeah, that's a great scripture, and it, it just yeah. arrested me. I'm like, okay, I need to come to Jesus to have life. I was neglecting the actual real relationship. I had a relationship with religion. Yeah. So, and the Bible allotry, yes. I... I very highly elevated the word of God. I mean, the scriptures, because, but th what I've learned since is that the scriptures, they bear witness to the true word of God, Jesus, the person, you know, their right. testimony, they're introducing you to the actual person uh, that you might have relationship. Relationship has always been the point yeah. of yeah. this thing. Love, yes. I had a, a professor in seminary, um, Dr. Samuel Proctor, who was a really great man, and he had um, been pastor of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in, in Harlem for many years, which was the largest black church for a long time. And he had um, been in charge of, under President John Kennedy, uh, in charge of the Peace Corps in Africa. And he'd done all kinds of stuff in his life. And he, he was from Virginia, and he had a very um, neat way of talking, kind of slow. And... Um, he said one time, he said, you know, when you read the Bible, you got to put your Jesus glasses on and you got to see everything through Jesus and then you'll understand. And that sound, that, that sound kind of put your Jesus glasses on and you'll understand. Well, Dr. Oh, yeah. Proctor like nailed it right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you, when you put your Jesus glasses on and read the Old Testament about where they're coming to Jesus and when they're walking away from him, and they do both in the Old Testament. They come to him and they, and they abandon him, you know. Mm -hmm. And you see the battle going on in the New Testament with, with uh, Paul um, getting uh, pretty upset about things that are going on, about like, you know, the circumcisers coming in after him and saying, hey, you guys, you, you can't possibly be a follower until you all get circumcised and stuff like that. And he's like, you know, Paul gets yeah. pretty ugly and stuff like that. Yeah, and we still have stuff to contend with today, you know, um, as far as as false teachers. I really believe that perhaps that was the the thorn in Paul's side were those Judaizers who were just following him everywhere and just causing him so much grief. Like, leave these guys alone. We have the the freedom and the, the absolute freedom in the Holy Spirit and and the freedom from the law and the circumcision and all that stuff. Yeah, and of course, there's so much teaching um, in the New Testament. It's just the New Testament is so liberating, you know, when you really unpack that and how free we are in Christ. Free in love. Well, I love how you started the book um, talking about you addressed a common mistake that the world makes in only relating to the historical Jesus, you know, only considering in terms of the historical Jesus. And you see that through all the documentaries, everything, you know, that's all they that's all they ever do. You don't think about, okay, what about the aspect of like who he claimed to be? Like, let's talk about that. Let's unpack the fact that he's claiming that I am the I am, you know, yeah. that I yeah. am God in the flesh come to save you 
on a rescue mission, you know, uh, bringing back his creation, his children back into intimate fellowship, back into the garden of relationship, you know, back into friendship. That's what your book's about. Right, right. I, lo I love that. So, what I, like to, I, yeah. I like to tell people Jesus is my best friend. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in any way to diminish his importance, but in our relationship, I'm getting, I'm getting stirred up here. Yeah. In, in our relationship, he's the only one that ever tells me the truth. Yeah. My wife likes to think she's the truth teller, but sometimes it's her own agenda. You know, it's like, I mean, and yeah. sometimes she doesn't have the bigger picture. Um, but she's, my wife is a really good friend and I love her. And I appreciate the fact that she was trying to keep me on the straight and narrow, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. he, he's the real truth teller and um, grounded in our friendship. I can um, persevere through anything. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have um, a physical problems, you know, I take it to him. If I have an emotional problem, I take it to him. If I have uh, worries, I take it to him. I, I dump everything on him. And it's okay <laughs> because he says, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy burden, you know, and I'll give yeah. you rest. I mean, he says, um, I put it in the vernacular, give me your junk, hand it all over to me. Um, when my yeah. father was dying, I gave my dad, and I mean, he was literally in the process of dying and I gave my dad to Jesus. And like, yeah. I went from great despair about my dad. It was really complicated, but it was just really despairing. He you know, had Alzheimer's and it was ugly and terrible. Hmm. Gave, I, I literally, in my imagination, handed my father over to Jesus and Jesus took him. And gotcha. when he took him, I was filled with such peace and much, such joy. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable that, um, and some people inappropriately you know, said, well, is your dad in heaven or in hell? And I said, hmm. That's, I, I don't know. I don't <laughs> care. He's in Jesus's hands. Yeah. Whatever my dad needs is the exact right thing for him. Mm -hmm. You yes. know, I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to second guess like, oh, maybe, maybe Jesus isn't bright enough to figure this out or kind enough to figure this out. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus totally gets it. He, he knows, he knows my father from before he was born and the yeah. messed up household with the alcoholic father he was raising. He knows, he knows all that stuff. He knows all the things, all his insecurities and anxieties that caused him to do stupid things. And he knows all the goodness that he tried to do. And, um, you know, he, know, he knows it all. I mean, like, who, I couldn't give my dad over to a better individual yes. in the whole universe. Yeah, and that's, like, that's beautiful. So I can, I can certainly give um, Jesus my, my cares and anxieties and hopes and fears. Right. You know, and, and I love that, that whole concept of like Jesus died on the cross to take all of our guilt, all our shame, all our regrets, all our sin, yeah. that, to make all that his own, you know? And so he's like, Jesus is like, I want my stuff back, please. If you're carrying that around, I want my stuff back. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So that's why he's like, cast all your cares on the Lord. Every single burden. He wants his children completely care free in the care yeah. of God. Yeah. And so that's what leaning on God, be, befriending God. You know, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart because whenever I see in scripture about God being our friend, that just really resonated with me. It was like, okay, that is a, a level that I, I, that really spoke to me. You know, there's other terms that God uses to describe our relationship with him, like father to son and even a husband to a bride or a sheep to a shepherd. You know all these terms, but like to be his friend, like wow, wow, yeah. that he's inviting that, you to that and, level. You know, and, that, and that's the core of my experience with him um, on June 1st, 1985, was he could have dropped a mountain on me. He mm -hmm. could have put my head in a vice and turned the, you know, the screws. He could have, he could have walked away from me. He could have um, said, you know, you're pitiful. You know, you're not worth it. 
I mean, he could have he could have done any of those things, mm -hmm. and and I. what deserved i mean i i deserved it. i didn't do hmm. anything mm -hmm. for him except um betray him all the time mm -hmm. and deny him and instead he just um it's not just a question of love i knew that there was something about me he really liked there was a lot of things that i did in my life and he showed me these things yeah. and it was painful he showed me the things that i'd done in my life that he didn't like but not in a um, punitive way, in a way to um, redeem me, to, to bring me back. Because it is absolutely clear to me, and, the, and, he, and he, made, he told me this, he showed me this, he's demonstrated this, that all he wants is good for us. And the reason why we have morality is because Immoral things are destructive to society, to each other, and to ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's why we have um, morality. But morality is a way to have the best life. It's not about trying to um, jam us up so we don't have any fun. Yeah. You know, too many Christians have been baptized in vinegar. Yeah. You know? <laughs> My goodness, yes. Uh, he, yes, he has the best hopes and wishes for us, and he wants all his children to be safe and, and live the fullest lives. I've come yeah. to give you life and give it a, more abundantly, give it you life to the full, Jesus said. And so he's got all these safeguards. He's got, you know, like even the the, the, the police and the military and the systems of government, that, those are set in place, the Bible tells us, uh, for our, our good and our protection and, and all these things. Because, yeah, so that's that's great. And I love what you said about your father. Let's go back to that for a moment. Like, like Jesus knew all the reasons why. He knew all the reasons about the hangups before I, you know, like he knew them before he even created them. Like there's this verse um, in the Bible, and this actually leads to a question that my friend had even. Um, and actually it's a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart too, about um, where he says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Yeah. You know, I look at that scripture and I, and I think, okay, so you could look at that and say, okay, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, like we had a relationship, like I knew you like a friend, you were a spirit with me before you went on this <laughs> human journey yeah. experience, like a, like a pre-mortal life uh, thing. So that to me is very fascinating to think about. And I think about like, well, what was what was that like before I came here? Because I believe that I do, yeah. and um, and I think it's a very Christian thing to believe based on some scriptures. Even um, Romans chapter eight um, hints at that. Some other scriptures hint at that. Like there's stuff in the Bible that that tells us this pretty much. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I've I've known mm -hmm. people that are really into pre-existence, and mm -hmm. you know, and they and they um, are really into like we were all up in heaven and said, well, I, I need to life lessons. So I think this time I need to go back and be a um, paraplegic and, you know, <laughs> or I need yeah. to go back and I want to be like super wealthy or I need to go back and be really homely or I need to go back and be, you know, persecuted terribly. So I'll shoot. I mean, that, yeah, I know, right? I, I, I don't know. That just doesn't resonate. I, from my experience, I don't know anything about preexistence. Okay. Okay. I, and so I speculate like anyone else does. I think that when the Bible said he knew us before we were born, in the Bible, knowing someone means more than you know their name and address and occupation. You know, mm -hmm. it means you really know them. And so if God says, I knew you before you were born, it means a, a, a depth of knowing mm -hmm. How, what we were whether we were just a, a, a little beam of light or whether we were right. a being, a spiritual being, I don't know. And um, I don't believe in, pre, in double predestination. I think that God knows everything, but God also gives us free will. And I think there's a real tension between um, God wanting and hoping and planning for the best of us and us uh, making our choices. The way I see life is that um, in every moment we make choices 
and we have um, really good choices, godly choices, and we have really bad choices, anti-God choices, and then a variety of things in between. Mm -hmm. And what God is um, intending for us to do with this life, what God's will is for our life is to, to actually think with our heart and with our mind about trying to make the best choices at every minute. And I, let me just, ju let me just illustrate this real simply. Um, my wife is a pediatric occupational therapist. She works with um, disabled, little disabled children. She's been doing it for almost 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And the life expectancy in her work is six years because it's tremendous burnout. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the children, it's the, the system, the families, the, mm -hmm. the bureaucracy. Um, the kids are great, but there's a lot of things conspiring to um, keep her from doing the therapeutic work that she wants to do, which she, um, she has a gift from God for that type of work. Anyways, so she does a visit and they're um, heroin addicts. The parents are heroin addicts. The home is um, filthy beyond what any of your listeners can imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, f filth that you can't believe actually exists. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the children are the children have disabilities, and my wife's there. What what she does in the visit is work with the child, but more importantly, work with the parents to try and train them to do the work that. She, the child needs the therapy that they need to develop and the parents are so stoned they don't know who she is or why she's there or what they're doing yeah How do and she comes home that? and she's very very upset yeah. and she's not in a happy pretty mood what's my job my job is to love her and listen to her and mm -hmm. to be kind and not tell her what to do and not try and cheer her up or anything. It's just to be, you know, as present and as sympathetic and as kind as possible. Maybe I didn't have the best day in the world, or maybe, maybe there's something I want to talk about that like has nothing to do with her work. You know, maybe I, what I think is much more important, you know, yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's the, those are the kind of choices we make every day of our life. You know, the choices for love. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I, that's what I love about, you know, I, I highlighted that in our last talk, um, Jesus words to you when you met him in your near death experience, uh, where he says, our plan is for you to love the person that you're with. Right. You know, as you go through your life, just love whoever you're with. That's, that's all, you know, that that's the best thing, right? That's, that's amazing. And so for that example, it's perfect, perfect example of like, okay, you lo loving her other centered self giving love. Honestly, that was, that was my favorite, favorite chapter in this book was, was the chapter on love. And I'd, I'd... well, thank you so much for joining us for part one of this interview with Howard Storm, Befriend God, Life with Jesus. There's much more to come, and some of the most exciting parts of this interview will be in future episodes. So please subscribe so you can stay tuned for what's coming next. I didn't want to give you an hour and a half all at once, but I'm breaking this up into three parts. So, hey, and I appreciate your support as well. If you like what you're hearing, Yes, please do subscribe, like, and share this video. And you can also support my work at patreon.com slash reflectworship. Um, that is the, the page that kind of encompasses all the ministry aspects of what my wife and I do. We also have a music ministry called Reflect Worship, which you can check out at reflectworship.com. But yeah, go to patreon.com slash reflect worship if you want to join uh, with us and partner with us to bring this great content into the world uh, we thank you thank you in advance for checking that out and um, yeah considering 
supporting this ministry. And you're about to hear a song called Unfailing Love from our album Reflect Love, which you can pick up at reflectworship.com or download at reflect.bandcamp.com. Thank you so much. Unfailing love